up uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Paul is now writing or dictating the letter. Remember, the way his letters were written was that he would compose them by um, dictating them to a secretary or what was known then as an amanuensis, someone who took uh, stenography, I guess. I don't know if there was such a thing as Greek shorthand or not, but um, that's how uh, these would be composed. So, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you, about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, what we see Paul doing here is very much an extension of what we saw uh, in the tone set by the first two verses. He is not pulling apostolic rank on them here. There is no need for him to do that at this point. There is, even though some people have tried to read into his call for unity within the body of Christ. Some people have tried to read into that, that Paul is addressing um, a church in conflict. There is simply no evidence for that. And, uh, you know, buttressing the idea that this is not a church in conflict is the fact that he does not use his apostolic rank. You know, when he was introducing himself to the Romans, who had never met him, for him to refer to himself as an apostle, that made sense. Even when Paul talks about being an apostle, though, you know, he talks about himself as the least of the apostles and uh, talks about his own uh, former opposition to the church. So even when he, quote, pulls rank, he does so in a way that is humble. But here, there's no need for him to remind the, the church at Philippi of his apostolic position. He is coming to them as a brother in Christ, as a fellow slave to Jesus Christ, as one who um, emulates Christ as a servant. Um, and I think, in a way, this even adds to the power of his words because um, he, he views all who trust in Christ as being equals, uh, equally dependent upon the grace of God. Now, notice here in verse 3 and 4, he talks about how he um, thanks God for the church at Philippi every time he remembers them every time he thinks about them. And he lists his um, reason for being thankful for them in verse 5 because they have a partnership with him in the gospel and have had such a partnership with him from the first day that the first people um, you know, came to faith in Jesus Christ there when the, in the passage we read last night from Acts 16 when he met God-fearers who were worshiping at the river outside of town together. 
and they wanted to hear more about Jesus. And if you read on in Acts 16, you'll, you saw how Lydia and her household were baptized at that point. Now, in verse 4, we have the first occurrence of a word that is really um, synonymous with the letter to the Philippians, and that's joy. And uh, it's interesting because in the um, New Interpreter's uh, Bible commentary, they have a little bit of a discussion about this. The reference to joy in verse 4 is typical of this epistle in which joy is a constant theme, and I mentioned that last night. The noun, kara, uh, which means joy, and the cognate verbs to rejoice, chairo, and to rejoice with, which is sub chairo, those three words, the cognates of the word for joy, are used 14 times in this short letter. And this is part of what makes this letter so remarkable. This underscores an important fact. Paul experiences joy in his relationship with Christ, despite the fact that he is imprisoned for his faith in Christ and facing capital punishment, facing uh, the possibility, which eventually occurred, of his execution. Uh, then the uh, writer here, this the the uh, commentator, by the way, <clears throat> is a a Presbyterian, or excuse me, a Methodist scholar, uh, born in 1931, named Morna Hooker. It's it's a woman, and um, while. Um, I don't agree with some of her theology, and that comes through in her commentary in places here. Uh, she's a very respected um, New Testament scholar, and she specifically or particularly has an expertise when it comes to the writings of Paul. But uh, she goes on to write here, the four occurrences of all, and I mentioned the Greek word is Pa or its cognates, uh, pa's rather, P A S is how it would be spelled when we transliterate it into the English. The four occurrences of all in two lines of Greek text, every constantly, always, every, all, all, are surely indications of the measures of Paul's gratitude rather than hints, etc., about some problem. In other words, Paul absolutely is grateful for this church and their partnership in the gospel. Now, so this is a thank you letter, and he's going to extrapolate from that and talk about the joy that we, that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. And in verse 5, he uses that word that's translated as partnership. Now, in the original Greek, and this is a word that you're probably familiar with, it's a cognate of the word koinonia, um, which is roughly translated uh, from, from the Greek into English as fellowship. Um, it's related to the word for common. It's to have things in common, which is the word or the phrase that's used, you remember, in Acts about the early church no one in the early church believed that anything belonged to just them, but they held all things in common. They shared together. Well, many times when this word is used, it's not just about the fellowship of the church, you know, the kind of thing that we we say happens over donuts and coffee or cookies and coffee after worship. Um, it's um, It's much more than that. It's being in community with another person and, if you will, having skin in the game. Uh, on multiple occasions, and I'm not going to go through all of the citations, but on multiple occasions in the New Testament, 
when Paul uses the word koinonia, he talks about um, sharing uh, financial gifts or offerings and expressing thanks for them. Notice, though, that it's not just for him because he says we have this partnership in the gospel. The idea is that it's, it may include finances, but it's much more. And it's a partnership that they share, not for Paul's good, but for the good of those who might be reached through the ministry that Paul leads. You know, Paul traveled along with other people uh, in the same way that Jesus did. Uh, and we read, again, that passage from Acts 16 last night. Um, Luke was definitely with him. There were others who were with him. Silas, for example. And so they worked to support themselves when they went to these cities. Um, Paul was a tent maker his entire life. But, you know, for the things they were trying to do, for food, etc., it was helpful but uh, to have financial support. But koinonia also meant the support of prayer and encouragement. Um, sending messengers to just say, how are you doing? Or here's what we're praying for you. Or here's a little offering that we gathered, right? So he's talking, all, all of these things are encompassed by the word koinonia. And he's thankful for their partnership. And it brings him joy that he's in partnership with them in the gospel. Now, think about this, because Philippi was uh, the, the place where the church first moved out of Asia Minor. And they had made a bit of a splash in Asia Minor already. And, but Paul was prevented from going any further and farther and was um, directed by the Holy Spirit to go into Macedonia. So he's filled with joy about this. Now, notice something because this is very Pauline theology. Verse uh, 6, he says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the work of God, the, the work of the triune God, uh, who brings us to faith. So Paul's not taking any credit for having brought these people to faith. He was a mere instrument of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the people there in Philippi uh, who met him for the first time on that Sabbath day um, had been open to receiving the testimony about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was the beginning of God's good work in them. Notice here, when he talks about a good work, he's not talking about something human beings do. Uh, Paul says that when God initiates the faith journey of a disciple of Jesus Christ, it is the beginning of a good work in them. And, of course, the, the, the prayer and the hope that he's going to, that he mentions later in this block of verses is that it's going to issue in um, good fruit the fruit of righteousness. So righteousness has been given to those who, who, who believe in Jesus Christ, who receive the gospel message, and as they receive it, faith is constructed within them. And we first receive it uh, in the Lutheran Church at baptism, which is, uh, if you will, the wet word, the word of God coming to us, through uh, holy baptism to begin to witness to us uh, the word about Jesus Christ. So he's saying uh, God be began something, whether it was at the moment of their baptism or in the case of the adults when they first believed and wanted to be baptized. 
he's confident that God will go on to complete it all at the day of Jesus Christ. And that's where that uh, thing I have in the comments comes in. Paul uses the phrase, the day of Jesus Christ, or the day of Christ, or the day of the Lord, interchangeably. And you see from the Lutheran Study Bible, um, this is a, a phrase that is used in one form or another throughout the Bible, referring to when God will, uh, as it says, dramatically reveal and execute his judgment by condemning the wicked and delivering the righteous. And the, the prophets use this a lot. First Peter talks about it, as you see there. Paul talks about it a lot. Jesus talks about it a lot. The day of the Lord is the day when Jesus will return and judge uh, between the righteous and the unrighteous, whose righteousness uh, or unrighteousness hinge on whether they have trusted in Jesus Christ because we can't make ourselves righteous. So what Paul is saying here is that he is confident that God is going to complete his work in us. So, you know, there's there are times when we Christians, and you've heard me on this hobby horse before, we, we turn our guilt into shame. And those are two different things. Guilt is that prick of the conscience that the Holy Spirit uses to, uh, in the preaching of the law to turn us back to God in repentance so that we can receive grace and be saved by that grace, right? So that we do not wander like, you know, lost sheep chasing after the next thatch of, of grass. Shame is when we take our guilt and we accept the devil's lie that uh, the fact that we are sinners means that we are utterly without hope. Uh, shame tells us you're not good enough for God. Or it tells you you've got to do more to be worthy of God. No. Anytime uh, the devil or the world or your sinful self tells you you have to do more to be acceptable to God, you know that that's not right. Christ has done everything that is necessary for you to be acceptable to God. Your call is to turn to him and to trust in him. Or, I think more appropriately, to turn to him and be willing to trust in him because you can't even create trust within yourself. You turn in response to the Holy Spirit's call, and He does the work of faith within you. And He, as we turn to Him day in and day out, daily repentance and renewal, as we turn to Him day in and day out, He builds up our faith. And He uh, makes us new. And on the day of Jesus Christ, the work will be completed. Uh, all the gaps that exist within each of us because we are not only saints but also sinners when we believe in Jesus Christ. The gap between Jesus and us will be bridged finally and definitively. And the, the good work that God began in us at our baptism or at the hour we first believed, as John Newton wrote in Amazing Grace, uh, all of that will be completed and that's a source of joy as well and what Paul is saying to the Philippians is thank you for being a partner in the sharing of this gospel but also in being brothers and sisters in this gospel who help in our mutual encouragement and our mutual accountability right that's a beautiful passage and then he says in verse 7 It is right for me to feel this way about you. Now, the word that um, is used there at the beginning of verse 7, it is right. The word is phroneo. And this word is interesting. It describes 
an attitude. It's more than just a thought, right? But it's not just a feeling. So it, it's sort of a, a melding of thought and emotion based on reality. And it's the attitude that this is what I believe, this is what I feel, this is what I know, kind of all melded into one word. That's, that's the idea of it is right. Now, what's interesting about this word, it is the same word that is going to be used of the attitude of Jesus in uh, chapter 2, verse 5, when Paul says, you know, have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus. The word that's used there is phroneo, have this phroneo in you. You see the idea? So it's a whole attitude, a whole way of approaching uh, life and reality and experience. It's, it's more than, it, it is not opposed to um, fact or intellectual or empirical evidence. It, it, it encompasses that, but it also encompasses emotion as well. It's just this full, complete confidence and this approach to life, right? So, Jesus in chapter 2, his whole approach in life, the mind that was in him was that of a servant, right? So Paul is saying uh, it's right for him to be thankful and rejoice in this partnership that he has with the people of Philippi in, in the gospel because he is confident, he can see, he perceives, and he feels, and he knows that God has begun this good work of faith in, in them, which will be completed on the day of Jesus, when, uh, or the day of the Lord, when Jesus returns and judges the living and the dead. So he says, it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. And then uh, again, once again, emphasizing this uh, partnership or this uh, fellow servanthood status in which he's not pulling apostolic rank on them. He says, for you are all partakers with me of grace. Is there a more important word for Paul than grace? The word, uh, some of you have seen me write this on, on whiteboards uh, over the years, but this is the word charitas. And when we transliterate it over into English, it becomes charity. Ch Grace is God's charity. You don't earn charity, right? It is a gift. The donor decides to give without thought of any kind of return coming back. So God, if you will, uh, donates Christ. He donates forgiveness. He donates justification. He donates righteousness through Christ to all who trust in Christ. Right. So it, it and, and he and uh, what does he say in Romans? Paul he says, while we were still weak in our sins, Christ died for the ungodly. So there was nothing we did to earn it. It was an act of charity, of grace by God for us. And all we can do is put our dukes down and receive that grace and then grace. Uh, given to us through the word, given to us by the Holy Spirit, goes to work on us. So he says, it's right I should feel this way about you because I know you partake of the same grace which has saved me. And he says that they do this uh, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. The idea here is you have not abandoned me. I draw great joy, Paul is saying, from the fact that you have not turned away from me. You've continued to support me with prayers and encouragement and people you've sent with your messages and whatever else I've needed. You've been there in this partnership in the gospel. Um, and then he talks about how he yearns to see them with the affection of Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to talk about their growth in the faith. He says in verse 9 that it's his prayer that their love may abound more and more. The, the word in the Greek is uh, uh, 
uh, mala kai mala. More and more and more may it abound, your, your love. Uh, along with, this is interesting, knowledge, that's, that's knowing about God, and discernment, which is the ability to see through and understand, to gain understanding, uh, so that you will learn to approve what's excellent and you know, be filled with the fruit of righteousness. So he's, this, this whole thing, this thanksgiving and prayer section is all about um, Paul yearning for their continued growth in grace their continued growth in faith so that as as they trust in Jesus more, the fruit of their faith, the good work that God has begun in them will become more and more manifest so that our, our daily renewal in our relationship with Christ means that Christ is more present in our attitudes, our phroneo, our phrone, I guess, and uh, and just comes out. You know, it's like uh, the old song we used to teach the kids, if you're happy and you know it, then your life will surely show it, right? It's not about happy so much, but it's if Jesus is in there and Jesus is growing in you, that will come out. Um, C.S. Lewis does a great job of describing this process of its sanctification, which is not something that we willfully pursue. We simply follow Jesus and the sanctification happens because God's word does not return empty. God's word does what it sets out to do in us, which is grow us as Christians. By the way, this is pretty much Lutheran Lutheranism 101, folks. So uh, let me see here if I've got any other... I wanted to check. I've been chatting quite a bit here. I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing any comments. So that's his prayer. We could talk more and more about that, but I'm not going to. Now verses 12 to 14. I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now this is really interesting because uh, he... Paul is talking about a paradox that you see almost everywhere the church is growing. And the paradox is this. It grows when persecuted. The church's power grows when it is at its weakest. When uh, authorities and societies are arrayed against it. The church doesn't do that well when everybody's a Christian and everybody goes to church. The witness of the church becomes anemic in those times because, I think, number one, in order to gain acceptance, it has likely made some compromises about the gospel and about the word of God, or it just blends in with the rest of society and it becomes sort of a good works society, a good works fellowship. Uh, when the church grows, when people's certainty about the gospel grows, when their dependence on God grows, is when it faces resistance and persecution. This is why Paul can say of his own personal experience, when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because when I know that I cannot rely on the crutch of power and acceptability in the world, 
I have nowhere else to go but to Jesus Christ. So friends, notice the word I use there. The crutch is not Jesus. The crutch is the world. The people of the world, by and large, depend on the crutch of the world because that's where acceptance is. That's where money is. That's where popularity is. That's where, you know, getting along is. But when you are willing to get rid of your crutch and acknowledge your weakness, it's then that Jesus can help you stand with boldness and love and faith and joy. So here we have this paradox. Here's Paul in prison, indicative of the idea that the church has, in, in, in some ways, become unacceptable. And in seeing this, the people who are most aware of Paul's situation, where he's imprisoned, have grown bolder in sharing the faith. Christians in other parts of the Mediterranean basin who have heard about what Paul is going through have become bolder in sharing their faith. Why? Because the church is being persecuted and there's a recognition that we cannot rely on the goodness or the goodwill of the world. We need to rely on Jesus Christ alone. And so Paul says, I want you to know that my being here has actually served to advance the gospel. More people are proclaiming Christ more overtly. We've seen this, and I've mentioned this example before, but we've seen this in recent years in Ethiopia, where the church has been attacked and assaulted over and over again. Churches burned down, uh, pastors thrown into prison because of their faith. And what has happened as a result of this? The Makani Jesus Church in Ethiopia, which is the Lutheran church there, is one of the fastest growing churches in the world. Um, and they're beginning to send people to America to share their faith in Jesus Christ. Our Southwest Ohio Mission District, uh, Mission Region Convocation is going to be at the Oromo uh, Lutheran Church in Columbus in May, on May 7th. And I hope all Living Water folks will go there because we're going to worship big time when we go there. But uh, what happened? The church in Ethiopia was persecuted and the church in Ethiopia prayed and relied more deeply on Jesus Christ and the church grew and is growing. It is larger, um, I believe this is true, it is larger now than the largest Lutheran bodies in North America together. And so it is growing as a result of this dependence on Jesus. And you've, you've heard me get on this hobby horse before, but there's a lot of whininess among Christians in North America, and I particularly... I particularly single out our evangelical sisters and brothers. Um, they complain about things in the media. They complain about, you know, cups at Starbucks. They complain, and they call it persecution. It's not persecution, but I will guarantee this, and we've already seen this, that kind of ins insipidity, that stupidity, that nonsense causes people who have had no exposure to the gospel to be hostile toward the church. And you're going to bring on the very persecution that you think you're suffering right now. Uh, we have not faced persecution in North America. Are there people who don't like the Christian message? Yes. And uh, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, Betty, the Pacific Northwest is probably the least churched region in America. But you're not going to win those people by being whiners. Paul was never a whiner. Stephen was not a whiner. Peter didn't whine. They were compassionate and loving and bold in proclaiming the gospel. And that's what we need to be about. And people take note when that happens. 
I'm going through a hard time. I still trust in Jesus Christ. I face adversity. I still believe in Jesus Christ. And this is what people saw in Paul. And he's saying, this has served to advance the gospel. He says that it's been known throughout the whole imperial guard. And that's a reference to the praetorium in Rome, we uh, assume. So these are people in the upper echelons of Roman society. And they are noticing the way these Christians are responding to adversity, not by praying or seeking harm to the opponents of the gospel, not by going out and getting involved in some sort of political movement to overthrow the government or to sue for their rights, by proclaiming Jesus Christ and have become bolder. So I think that's a really amazing uh, section there. Notice, too, he addresses them in verse 12 as brothers, Adelphoi. Now, we know that the Philippian church, we saw that in the passage from Acts 16, was really started by women. Um, but he uses the term brothers here, and I think it's because in Jesus Christ, we become like the firstborn sons who are heirs of God's grace. So uh, this once more is this koinonia, this partnership in the gospel in which we are all fellow servants or slaves of Jesus Christ. That's a theme that runs through uh, Philippians, I believe. Verse 15. He says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, that is, those who preach from envy and rivalry, proclaim Christ out of uh, rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice." There's another cognate of the word joy, rejoicing. So what's Paul saying here? Uh, my imprisonment has served for the advancement of the gospel, he's already said. Now he's saying that some are proclaiming Christ out of envy and rivalry. Uh, they're, they're, in essence, bouncing off of Paul and saying, we're not like Paul, and then they proclaim the gospel. And then others who are in sympathy with Paul's proclamation of the gospel and proclaim the gospel. Paul says, I don't care what their motives are. I, I don't even care whether or not they are in a right relationship with God themselves. I mean, I do, but it doesn't matter what their motives may be for proclaiming the gospel. The bottom line is they're proclaiming the gospel, right? And so that that redounds to the glory of God, and in that I rejoice. In other words, I don't care if they like me or not. I don't care if they use me as a bogeyman or a bouncing off point and say, well, uh, Paul's over there and he's a Christian, but let me tell you about the gospel. And then they proclaim the gospel. Paul says, I don't care whether they like me or paint a good picture of me. What's important is the picture that's painted of Jesus Christ, that, that Jesus is seen as the way and the truth and the life, that Jesus is the one who is seen as the way of reconciliation with God, you know, so that we are saved by grace through faith in him. So uh, Paul is saying that even in his imprisonment, when he's not allowed to roam around and preach the gospel because of him and his adverse experience the gospel is being preached and people are talking about it so the word is being proclaimed and what does he say in Romans 10 17 faith comes by hearing the word about Jesus Christ so in that he rejoices you know we we get hung up in competitions and rivalries and, and so forth in the church. But the bottom line is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what brings people to salvation and eternal life 
that's what brings them into an eternal relationship with God. And so that should be the most important thing. All right. Oh, I've got just a few more minutes and I haven't even got through the first chapter. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop right there because this next block, I can't do it by it on its own. But it's all about joy, the joy of the gospel. So keep that in mind. I promise we'll get through one and two <laughs> next week. But uh, this is a, just a wonderful, wonderful uh, letter, as you can see. And Paul is definitely on his game. Yeah, because I want to I want to go into a conversation of a particular word here that's really important. And then one verse that just stands out in this next block. So I'm not going to go into it now. It's 951. I've babbled enough. So let's uh, let's close in prayer. And we'll close tonight by uh, lifting up um, people we talked about earlier in our prayers. Father, we lift up to you um, Ed's mom and Sophia. We lift up to you also uh, Lou and Donna and Janet and Mark and Brian and Pastor Chuck and his son and his wife, Clara. And we lift up to you all who are in need of your healing touch. We lift up Bob and we ask that you would bring them healing. God, I, I pray tonight for uh, a person who graduated from the same high school I graduated from a few years ago, uh, a long time ago, um, but a few years ahead of me. Uh, whose uh, daughter uh, has died. And um, I pray that you would bring her comfort. She lost her brother a few months ago. So I pray that you would uh, bring your blessings of comfort and encouragement to Janet. Um, Father, we thank you that you are the God who heals the brokenhearted. And you fill with your peace and strength, those who acknowledge their need of you. Lord, help us to remember what Paul says elsewhere, that when we are weak, when we are uh, devoid of any power of our own, and we can finally acknowledge that, no matter what our age or physical condition, we are weak without you. We pray then that we would turn to you in humility and receive the strength that comes to those who trust in you through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the victory that you give to us over sin <clears throat> and death and the evil one. And that you give that victory to us not just um, in eternity after we've been raised from the dead, but even now in the midst of challenges. Father, this night we also lift up our world and we pray that you would thwart the plans <clears throat> <clears throat> of Putin to invade Ukraine and that you would thwart all of the thugs of the world and that you would <clears throat> protect the people of Ukraine and protect the people of Europe uh, from aggression. We ask the same thing for those who might be threatened uh, by Xi in China. And Lord, we ask for your church everywhere, especially where it's persecuted, to be bold and humble in proclaiming the good news of new and everlasting life through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I appreciate you all being here with me tonight. We'll pick up at chapter 1. Right, We're right in the middle of verse 18. Uh, and we'll begin next Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. God bless all of you. Bye now.